All right, three weeks from today uh, will be confirmation presentation at the 7 p.m. Uh, service on that first Monday in May, which I think is May 2nd. Um, which means on that Saturday, we will have confirmation presentation practice starting at 8 o'clock that Saturday morning up in the sanctuary. Um, you should know about this. It was in the uh, uh, handouts that we gave you at the beginning of the year, um, saying that that's what we're going to be doing. So that's what's happening with that. Now, who else you need to start? Just start calling people's name out to measure. I have everybody here. Oh, well, you don't have Miss Burkholder. I am, but I, I've got to get to what I'm doing here. Uh, Pastor Stecker will not be here tomorrow or Tuesday, so I'll be teaching class. Uh, we'll be going over the, the whatever readings the New Testament history we're going to be doing, uh, but when he gets back on Thursday, he's going to pick up and continue working on your presentations. He's told me many of them are very, very good, so we're looking forward to that. So continue to work on those things. Uh, if you have any questions on that, uh, you, obviously, you can ask me, Pastor Shoemaker, or I, obviously Pastor Stecker when he gets back. But he, he's, by this time, you should be well along in the process of getting that uh, done and the topics that you're covering. Uh, parents, ask your children how they're doing. Better yet, ask them to do the presentation uh, as they work through that um, and uh, as you go through that. Another thing that I want to point out is because of that, two weeks after that, is confirmation service itself, um, which will be at the 10.30 service that Sunday, which I think is the 16th, whatever that Sunday is. I'm going to do it off the top of my head. Um, the day before, we will have confirmation practice um, and at 8 o'clock in the morning, which we will run through the rite itself. Have you ever, you know, your gowns will be here. Uh, you'll wear them, pictures, and all that wonderful stuff that goes along with that uh, as well. But one of the things that uh, we um, ask of you, uh, and I don't know if Pastor Stecker has shared this with you yet, but I want to share this with you about confirmation verses and whatever verse that you would like to pick. Um, there is on our webpage, on the confirmation site of the webpage, is... Uh, a list of confirmation verses that uh, you can choose from. Now, if there's something on there that that you would like that's not on the list, that's fine too. Just let us know what that is. Um, and so, really, I had set up this for me. There we go. So if you go on our webpage, manualnh.org, go, go to the confirmation part, you will find, and on the top of the list will say confirmation verses, or you can go here for confirmation verses. On here is a list of many, many confirmation verses that you can pick. What we need from you in the next couple weeks, uh, so that we can put on your confirmation verse, and I'm sure some of you want to put other places, uh, what that verse might be. Um, if you want the pastors to pick, we're more willing to do that, um, but this is how I do that. And if it says Judas went and hung himself, then that's your confirmation verse. I don't think that you want that, you want that to be a confirmation verse. So that's on there. Did Pastor Stecker explain this yet? No. no. I'm, I'm teaching you something today with that. So that's there, all right? And like I said, just 
write it down. In fact, I want you to write it down the way that you would want us to read it. So either you email that uh, to me or the church office. You can write it out. Write it out for me. Just don't put down Psalm 23, verse 1. Write it out. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Whatever how you want to use it. Whichever version that you want to do, it's up there. So uh, please be aware of that as well. All right? So uh, a couple weeks from today, three weeks, um, we'll have a presentation. We'll have the practice the Saturday before, and then confirmation after that. We're coming down towards the end of uh, our confirmation class here, uh, which is a wonderful thing. All right? Thanks. Questions, comments? All right, where are you in the book? Why? Where are you in the book? If you were to open your workbook, where might you be? Yes, you can guess. Anybody know? I know Pastor Stucker kind of jumps out. Yeah. Forgiveness. I think we talked about. Are we talking? Are you doing absolution? I think that's kind of where he, he mentioned that that's where you might be. Um, with it. So if you would turn your catechism to page three oh six, three oh six. Lesson 25 of the book, but I'm not going to worry about the book, the workbook. I'm going to go through the past. Um, in uh, confession, one of the six chief parts, and it's the smallest of the six chief parts that we talk about, but it's very, very important, is the whole uh, subject of uh, confession and absolution. Um, and uh, in our, uh, what I find it very interesting that today, of all days, that I will be teaching this, that the readings for today, uh, Easter to the second Sunday after Easter, uh, plays a huge role in this part of the catechism. Um, so what is confession? Confession has two parts. First, that we confess our sins, huh. confess what we have done wrong. And second, that we receive absolution, that is forgiveness from the pastor as from God himself, not doubting, but firmly believing that by our sins are forgiven before God in heaven. So. Uh, divine service 1, 3, and 4, so the first, third, and fourth Sundays of the month, we do have confession and absolution. On the second Sunday, like today, we have Matins, but we do have confession and absolution there. I'll get to that, how that plays itself in with Matins. But it's, you know, uh, the pastor stands up in front, um, and uh, uh, we make this great confession. Now, I'm going to say this, and I'm sure you all have this by memory, from the epistle lesson from today, from 1 John chapter 1 and 2. Now, the, the phrase that we all know is that we, and, and I say this, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But, if our sins, God who is faithful and just will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. When we confess before God our sins, we are telling the truth. We are telling the truth about ourselves, that we stand before God as sinful human beings. We acknowledge that God is right. We acknowledge that we have been wrong, and that's what that's all about. So when we confess our sins, we are most definitely confessing what is right. Now, I'm talking about the public uh, form of this, so we come together as a group, a, a body of Christians, the family of God, and we do that. There are times and places where we might want to come to the pastor individually, or others individually, and do a more private confession absolution. But the same concept is still there, that we confess our wrongs, what we've done against God, against one another, and that we hear God's absolution. Now, as I stand up there and I make the announcement for the forgiveness of sin, I say this wonderful phrase, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, I announce to you by the authority of Christ that your sins are forgiven. I stand up there by the authority of Jesus Christ to announce to you that those sins that you have confessed, those sins that you admitted you have done wrong, God forgives you of them. That's absolution. Now, I don't do that by myself as God's extra. But I do that as a called, ordained servant of the Word, of Christ. I am as if God is speaking through me. So when you hear those words, you're going to hear this in the Catechism. This is so important that Luther underlined it. He said, it is as if God is speaking to you himself through the voice of the pastor. 
that when you hear that God has forgiven your sins, you can rest assured that God has forgiven you your sins. Question! Mm. Oh, sorry, one second. Um, when was confession and absolution instituted? Um, confession and absolution, even by the time uh, we get to the Middle Ages, it, is, it was a very common practice in the church uh, that people would come and more of a private confession and absolution, they would come to the priest, the pastor, and they would confess their sins, and the pastor, the priest, would announce forgiveness. Now, what happened, like most things, uh, it got corrupted. Meaning, they, the, the church, some of the church, abused the practice. Um, and many times you hear, uh, especially the Roman Catholics, they will go to confession, and then leave, and they have to do, like, Seven Our Fathers, Twelve Hail Marys, whatever. Um, and Our Fathers is the Lord's Prayer, um, and Mary's is the prayer that you pray to Mary. And it was a thought of, okay, you're sorry for what you did, but you have to make restitution. You have to do things. Uh, Luther comes around and says, when God forgives you your sins, you can't do any, you, the only thing that you are required to do, if you want to put it that way, is to live a life as a Christian, live in the forgiveness of sin. Now, Luther also said, if you did something wrong to somebody else, let's say that I stole from wine. And I go in and I tell the pastor, I stole 50 bucks from wine. One of the things that the pastor might say to me, you know what, you should pay wine back. And I should do that, if possible. If possible. Sometimes that might not be possible. Um, so I would do that, and then I would come to wine and say, I'm sorry for what I did, will you forgive me? But she would say, I forgive you. I forgive you. And then he should leave it at that, not saying, okay, are you gonna are you gonna pay me back? You, that should not, you should say, okay, I forgive you. Now, should I pay him back? Yes, I should do that. That that would be the right thing to do. That would be the right thing to do. So part of confession absolution is that we do those things. When I confess my sins in church. You know, and I say, okay, where have I sinned against God? Where have I sinned against other people? And primarily, who are the people that I sin against the most in my life? Who do I sin against the most? Who do you sin against the most in your life? Well, Jesus, but who else? Who are the most close people to you? Family. Family. You probably treat them worse than you treat total strangers. So, um, and there's a plaque up on the wall in my house, uh, and we, my wife and I got it when we were first married, and it, you know, the, the ingredients, kind of the gist of this, uh, a marriage is made up of two good forgivers. That we forgive. That we forgive one another. Now, I jokingly say, and I still do this, I wake up every morning, and I say to my wife, I love you, and I'm sorry. What are you sorry for? I don't know, but I'm going to mess up something to die today, and I'm sorry. You know, we can say that to God. I'm going to mess up, God. I mean, it's, I'm a simple human being. I'm going to try my best. Help me to do my best. But that's where forgiveness comes in, because forgiveness is the assurance that no longer will that wrong be held over me. Forgiveness is literally when, let's just say, that Lori came to me and she says, you know what, Pastor? I'm really sorry for hitting you very, very hard. And I say, I forgive you. What I'm saying, when I say I forgive you, I'm giving up the right to hurt her back the way that she hurt me. That's what forgiveness is all about. It's saying, I'm not going to hurt you the way I did. Remember when Jesus, the first words out of Jesus' mouth on the cross, what did he say? Father, forgive them, for they know not what they did. Who is the only person in the whole age of the world had every right to give back at somebody? It was Jesus. He did nothing wrong. He did nothing wrong. And yet, what does he say? Father, forgive them. In other words, Father, don't hold this sin against them. Don't hold it against them. So this is the whole, you know. And, and, and we hear it this morning in the Gospel reading, Jesus comes to the disciples in the upper room. He breathes on them the Holy Spirit, and he tells them, forgive. Forgive as you have been forgiven. If someone doesn't want to receive forgiveness, then you need to deal with that. You have to deal with that. But if a person wants to be forgiven, you forgive, just as God has forgiven each and every one of us. 
And that's the great joy we have. That's what sets Christianity apart from everybody else that we forgive. We do not demand repayment. We do not demand, oh, you hurt me, I'm going to hurt you. That's uh, part of that. So uh, we make that happen. Now, getting back to the book, what sins should we confess before God? Well, before God, we should plead guilty of all our sins, even those we're not aware of, as we do in the Lord's Prayer. But before the pastor, we should confess only those sins which we know and we feel in our hearts. So there are times and places people will come in, they will talk to me, um, and they, they have something weighing on their heart, and they will forgive their... I, I as their pastor, I'm saying. I'm saying this because Jesus told me to, that I can say to, to you this, is that God has forgiven you your sins. You can't. You, you don't have to worry about them. You don't have to make... Uh, God is forgiving you. He's not going to hold them uh, against you. And, and you can go away joyfully knowing that your sins have been forgiven. We do that on Sunday morning as well. We can make that happen. Now, which ones are these that are sins that we should confess? Well, according to the Ten Commandments. Huh. Oh, yeah. Are you a father, mother, son, daughter, or husband, wife, or worker? Have you been disobedient, unfaithful, or lazy? Have you been hot-tempered, rude, or quarrelsome? Have you hurt someone by your words or deeds? Have you stolen, been ne negligent, wasted anything, or done any harm um, with that? Now, turn to your catechism. To, let me find the part in here, because this is important. Um, page 37. Thirty-seven five. This is one of those unknown treasures in the catechism. If anyone on uh, Luther may not have written them, but they sure sound like Luther. Um, and he says, um, you know, in preparing yourself before you go to the sack, as you examine your life before you come to the Lord's table, these are just wonderful questions and answers. We will go through these. The Saturday before confirmation. As a class, we do this. Um, and it is our hope that you continue to do that, whether it's daily, weekly, or monthly, whatever the case may be. In here, uh, you know, as Luther had prepared these, uh, you know, the simple question, you believe you're a sinner? Yeah, I believe I'm a sinner. I mean, I'm sure it is. Don't be loose off. Um, how do you know this? Ten Commandments. I've not kept them. You know, you know you memorize, learn by heart the Ten Commandments. Um, in the gauge. Are you sorry for your sins? Of course. And it goes through all of these as well. What I want you to do today, later on today, I want you to read through these. Your homework assignment for today is read through the questions and answers on page 37 and following. Um, and it puts things in perspective. Not only that we confess our sins, but we receive this absolution that sins have been forgiven. Because of Jesus' death on the cross and his resurrection, uh, we have the forgiveness of all our sins. Um, and so, so we have it. This is the great joy of confession and absolution. It's this wonderful gospel that God brings to us. Um, and then we do that. Now, question on top of page 307. In what ways uh, in which people attempt to deal with sin and its consequences in their lives? What are some ways? And I want you to spend a couple minutes just discuss that amongst your parents, whatever that is, whoever's with you. How do people attempt to deal with sin and its consequences in their lives? Take two minutes. Go.
All right. In there it says, read 2 Samuel 11 and 12. That's the story of David falling into sin with Bathsheba. That whole adultery led to murder. David tried to cover it up. And that was David's trying to cover up his sin. Instead of confessing it, um, uh, he tries to cover it up. Uh, he brings Uriah the Hittite home, the wife, the husband of, of Bathsheba, and he's trying to do all this stuff until eventually David has uh, Uriah killed at the hands of the Philistines, but David is still responsible for that. Um, and that's what happens. So uh, eventually, in a, at the end of chapter 11, this, this wonderful, just the last sentence, what David did displeased the Lord. It just, that's a, just jumps out. What David did is in his order. In chapter 12, is God sending Nathan uh, to David. And Nathan tells this wonderful story of this man who owned this little lamb, the only one he owned, uh, and then his neighbor owned a whole bunch, and, but this uh, man who owned a bunch took the young little lamb, and David got great anger because David was a shepherd. Um, and through all that, uh, Nathan says, Nathan... For David, you're that man who had everything, and yet you took what wasn't yours. And uh, David eventually says, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan says, God has forgiven you. He has taken away your sin. But there's consequences to your sin. That son that was born to you, Bathsheba, God's going to take away. Um, and uh, that was the result. That was the consequence to David's sin. Now, that's also another important thing to remember, that you may confess your sins, but there's always a consequence to one's sins. Uh, I know I've used this example before. If I'm driving down Green Street, and I'm doing 70 miles an hour in a 30, the police officer is going to pull me over, and what's he going to give me? A ticket. I can say, I'm sorry all I want, and the officer is going to say, that's great, I'm glad you're sorry, rip, here you go, 350 bucks, whatever it is. You know, there's consequences to our sins. I like to think of it this way. If you throw a rock into a pond, what happens? There's the ripple effect that happens. Closer, bigger, farther out, smaller. But there's always a ripple effect. Every sin that we commit, there's a ripple effect. It's also true on the opposite end, too. Everything that every time we do good, there's a ripple effect that goes out as well. So I, I remind people, I just want you to know, when you sin, there are consequences, not only to yourself, but to others as well. To others as well. So there's that consequence. So think about what you're going to do or not going to do uh, before uh, you do it. Uh, in the kind of two-thirds of the way down in 307, as Christians, we confess our sins, we acknowledge the truth that we have failed to fear, love, and trust in God above all things. Christ's absolution declares me free of my sin through his word place in the mouth of a man. Um, and that's uh, from a Luther writing, a uh, brief explanation or exhortation on confession. Uh, uh, as, as Luther really said, this is extremely important. That you confess your sins, but more important that you hear that God forgives you your sins. Um, and so, so we have. So we talked about what's the first part of confession? We confess our sins. Hold up the Ten Commandments as a mirror, the second use of the law, um, and then we do that. Second part, we receive absolution. We hear that our sins are forgiven. Satan would want us to believe that whatever we've done is the worst thing ever, and there's no way God can forgive you your sin. I'm telling you, that's a lie. God, Jesus can forgive whatever sin. He always forgives sin. Uh, when Jesus said on the cross, Father, forgive them, that was not only for those people who were standing there on that Good Friday, but it was for all people for all time that uh, we, we confess our sins. Now, in pages 308 and 309, it talks about where, who should we confess our sins. Obviously, we confess all sins before God. Even the sins that we don't even know we're doing. Because we sin more than we ever know. Um, and that's part of our sinful condition. Um, we, we confess our sin before our neighbor. If we know we've done something wrong against our neighbor who does, we should go and confess that sin and receive uh, absolute forgiveness. And through our pastor uh, as well. Uh, and there are times and places for that, um, you know, to do that. Now, I want you to read the note in the middle of page 309. 
Individual confession for the pastor is not biblically required to receive the gift of forgiveness. They don't have to come. But it is a precious gift that should not be despised or neglected uh, for a troubled sinner, given the opportunity to hear the absolution personally. Divine service, yes, we stand up and we make our uh, general confession of our sins, and the pastor, uh, we may we pronounce that absolution. Um, here at Emmanuel, we're going to go to back that a little bit more, that the pastor is going to stand up and say, By the stead and command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I now see your sins are forgiven. When we have the seminarian working with us, we, he doesn't read that part. So we're going to kind of go back to that, that the pastor, hear that from the pastor, as if from God himself, as if God is using our voice. And I'd like to say, there's one pastor here whose voice sounds more like God than others. <laughs> he can't hear me upstairs. But uh, we have that. But even my voice, even Pastor Stecker, whoever the pastor may be, it's as if God is using that voice. Uh, and that we receive that absolution, this wonderful gift to hear that our sins are forgiven. And, that, and, that, and that's a great joy uh, to come and hear that in church. You know, what, what is the one word we often use throughout this, the, the divine, the worship service on a Sunday morning? What one word, and I talked about this, what is the one word? It begins with an A and ends with an Amen. Amen. You know, when we say, when the pastor says, uh, your sins are forgiven, we say amen. We're saying, yes, that's for me. Thank you, God. This is awesome. This is fantastic. Um, and so um, that, that we have that, which is just a wonderful thing as well. Um, the rest of this part of the catechism, um, you know, let's just put it this I'll put it this way. If you come in and you confess your sins to me in the private confession uh, and any pastor, it's, it, it stays with me. I don't blab it to anybody else. It only, it's only between you, me, and God. I don't tell anybody else. It's part of the, the confessional seal, as we call it. Um, now, if you tell me that you stole some money from people, one of the things I will tell you is that you should give that money back. You should make things right. If you did something wrong, you should go do something right. But if you don't, and I'll say, part of forgiveness, part of your forgiveness, this absolution, is that you want to amend your life, your ways, you should, you should try to do that. You should try to do that. Um, I'm not going to force you. I'm not going to go tell anybody else. That's the promise that I made when I became a pastor, that, um, that that stays between the two of us, whatever that might be, um, and that, that we can make that happen as well. All right, on page 312 and 313 in your catechism. And this is just a short form of individual confession and absolution. Um, and... While the pastor is parked there, it just, another thing is you could just do this by yourself as well and do it before God. That you plead that you're sinful, that you can sin, uh, you could do it with a family member, whatever that might be. Whatever that might be. Uh, that you hear, and knowing that your sins are forgiven. That you have the forgiveness of all your sins. Alright, page 314 and following. The Office of the Key. Right here, this key ring, this key particularly, this is the key to the office upstairs. Who owns this key? Who owns this key? Do I own this key? Or does Emmanuel Lutheran Church own this key? The church does. Emmanuel Lutheran Church. So that when I leave, what do I do with this key? I give it back. It's not mine. I use it. They gave it to me. I can use it. It unlocks a lot of doors. More doors than I really want to buy. But it does that. So this is the key to the office. In our gospel reading for today, if you've been in church, you will hear this from John chapter 20. Jesus comes in the locked room and he comes to the disciples and he breathes on them the Holy Spirit and he says to them uh, 
if, if you go forgive anybody's sins, they are forgiven. If you do not forgive, they are not forgiven. And with that, we call that the keys, uh, or the office of the keys. I got the key to the office, but this is the office of the keys, where we use this to open or unlock and lock. Uh, and the office of the keys is owned by who? Who owns that? Who did Jesus give that to? He gave it to the, he gave it to the church. He gave it to the church. That we can pronounce forgiveness, and we also can pronounce that if someone has not repented of their sins, we can say that their sins are not forgiven. I don't, as the pastor, I cannot arbitrarily say to Wyatt, sorry, I don't care how sorry you are, I'm not going to forgive you. I don't have the right to do that. Because Jesus said, if he confesses his sin, I'm just going to You know, if, if Wyatt is sorry for what he did, I, as his pastor, and as the church, we say, we forgive you. We forgive you. That's what we do. I can't do anything different. I, if he says he's sorry, I have to go by what he says, by his lifestyle, all that goes along with that. Sins have been forgiven. Absolution has been pronounced. And so the office of the keys is owned by the church. Jesus gave it to us, the church, so that we can share this good news of God's salvation, that we can pronounce that sins have been forgiven. Now, jumping down, you see in that box there, 314, where it's written, John 20. What do you believe according to these words? I believe when the called ministers of Christ deal with us by his divine command, in particular, when they exclude open 